Hey, this is a mini documentary, if you want to call it that, about my adventures going to Circuit of the Americas this year to track my second gen R8 V10 with a group of friends. You might ask, why Coda? You might ask why it's such a big deal to me. Let's dive in and I'll explain. The Circuit of the Americas, more commonly referred to as Coda, is the only grade one FIA spec road course in the United States, located near Austin, Texas. It opened in 2012 and has hosted races like the US F1 Grand Prix, IndyCar Classic, American Le Mans, Rolex Series, FIA World Endurance, etc. It's a counterclockwise track with 20 turns, an elevation change of 133 feet, and is 3.42 miles long, and was designed by Herman Tilka, and costs just under half a billion dollars to build. It has a back straight that's over half a mile long, and the track has a couple tight hairpins. There's a huge hill at the end of the front straight that allows for really late braking, and despite the track having several high speed straights, the majority of the time gain is actually for mastering the two technical bits before and after the front straight. It really is a world class track. A lot of people dislike Tilka and his track designs, but people generally seem to agree that this track is an exception. One thing that really sets this apart from many other courses is the fact that it's extremely photogenic. The circuit has a lot of paved runoff at nearly every corner, and a lot of it's stylistically painted red, white, and blue, with swooshes from the track's logo and stars and stripes paying homage to the American flag. The track also features an iconic and stylized observation tower in the center that's 251 feet high. It's great for bird's eye view of the track. Since F1 doesn't use Indy anymore, Coda is the only F1 track in the country, and as a car guy, getting to track my supercar on a world-class Formula One circuit is a pretty big bucket list item. This is especially more exciting because I'm in the Midwest where I'm not near, you know, any really high-profile tracks like Laguna Seca, VIR, Road America, Watkins Glen, Spring Mountain, etc. Let's talk preparations. This is a pretty big exciting trip for me, so I wanted to be prepared to make sure that I got my money's worth out of the trip since I knew it wasn't going to be cheap. Coda is located near Austin, so that's about 750 miles away from me. That means roughly 1500 mile round trip, and that's too many miles to put on a supercar unless you don't care about hurting its value. This means I pretty much needed to get a truck and trailer. Luckily, my buddy Scott lent me his aluminum car hauler. The ramps it has are long enough that it only needed a 2x12 at the end of the ramp to get my car on without scraping. I lucked out with the trailer, but still needed a truck to pull it with. I rented one with um, unlimited mileage and for a whole week and it cost me $620. Not cheap, but potentially less than the value lost by putting 1500 miles in the R8. Even if the mileage in the R8 would have been cheaper, uh, I had to take a whole bunch of gear and tools down and supplies, so the trailer and the truck worked out great. I asked for a half ton F-150, but for some reason, city rental truck gave me a giant three quarter ton turbo diesel quad cab long bed beast. More on that later though. Coda doesn't allow regular track days, so you only have a few options if you want to drive on the track. I went with MVP track time. It was $1,350 to reserve my spot. I did this early January as the spots are limited and it did end up selling out. I also prepaid for a garage to split with my friends. We did four cars per garage and so it was roughly $200 per car. I'm glad we did garages because the garages sold out and it rained the first day, so I felt bad for all the guys who were out in the parking lot having to work on their cars. We had five garage units total for our roughly 20 cars. We weren't the biggest group there, I don't think, but we had to have been close. I did have to book a hotel for the trip down because my friends wanted to caravan down but then stay the night at Hard Rock Hotel in Tulsa to kind of split the trip into two legs. That was $130 for the night. I also had to book the main hotel for the weekend in Austin. We stayed at a different hotel from the one that MVP Track Time recommended to avoid construction and traffic. We had a Cabela's parking lot right next to the hotel that fit our truck and trailers perfectly. There's also a large number of restaurants in that same like block, so walking to dinner or for drinks was really nice. Due to the track charging people for any and all damage to the track, I paid for a million dollar liability insurance from OpenTrack that cost $262. I also paid for insurance to cover my own car since this was at an unfamiliar track to me uh, during rainy season while driving with a bunch of complete strangers. That cost me $965 to cover all three days. Not cheap, but it'd be a lot cheaper than riding my car off if I put it into a wall. You never know. Better safe than sorry. I've never been happy with the brakes on the R8 since I've had it. I track with stock pads and those disintegrated after two track days. I tried EBC blue stuff and later the orange stuff. I didn't start with those because I thought they'd be good. It's just when you look up pads for 2017 plus R8s, and by the way, you should go do that if you don't believe me, nothing shows up anywhere. It's crazy. Um, it's just a really annoying side effect of having a really low volume car that's really new. I even emailed Hawk and they said they didn't make the pads for my car yet, which is pretty frustrating. 
After realizing the EBC pads were worse than the OEM pads, I decided to keep looking. I did message Carbotech and they actually got back to me and they actually had pads to fit. So finally, being such a big bucket list trip, uh, that's just expensive. I wanted to be sure that, you know, I got this right the first try. And so I needed to get the brake issue sorted once and for all. Therefore, I went ahead and just paid for the pre-bedded pads just to make sure I had no issues with trying to get them bedded in. That way I could just slap them on the car and be ready to rock. I also decided to move away from cheap auto parts store dot floor brake fluid and go ahead and just switch to a good brand. I decided to flush the system completely and switch to Motul RBF 600. I used 50 grit on my orbital sander to sand the resin off the uh, rotor rings. I left the rotors on the car to do this. It wasn't too big of a deal. Once I got the new pads on, I went for a test drive. Holy crap, brakes that bite. Man, I was pleased. It's the first time since I've had the car where I was actually confident with the brakes. Front uh, brake pads were $300, not really much more than the EBC crap. If uh, you have an R8, I would say don't ever touch EBC brake pads unless you want to die. Having tracked my R8 before, I knew that it likes to eat the shoulders of the front tires. So I took the car in for a track alignment and I actually talked about that in one of my vlog videos earlier. Basically, I had them add an extra degree of negative camber to the front wheels. The shop had to actually fabricate some shims to get the car beyond the factory limits, and it worked out great. The car turned in way more sharply, and the front tires had good bite, but also wore perfectly evenly. I attempted to find an aftermarket tow hook, as they usually have a much larger hole that's easier for the flatbed guys to attach to if you go off track or have an issue, but the whole low volume car thing really bit me again. Car ID's website showed that they have tow hooks that fit the second gen R8, but a few days before the trip I decided to finally test fit it, and it didn't fit. Not even close. Ugh. It's not the end of the world, but the OEM R8 tow hook's pretty ugly. Oh well. I was gonna take my race ramps, but after finding out the ramps and 2x12s are good enough to get the car on the trailer, I just left the race ramps at home. While I was already planning on getting a Hans device, going to an unfamiliar track was extra motivation to go ahead and order one. The only Hans device that works with regular three-point seat belts, though, is the Simpson Hybrid S. And since it's the only one that works with regular seat belts, they command a really stiff $1,000 price tag. It is carbon fiber and it is really sexy and it can save your life, so I guess there's that. Thousand dollars still better than being paralyzed or even killed. Luckily, the Sparco helmet that I had already came with the Hans posts built in, so I was ready to rock. To keep this brief, I'll probably make a separate video about the subject, but I basically practiced driving the track and memorized it on Project Cars 2 using my Fanatec wheel and pedal setup along with my Oculus Rift. That's the important part here though. With virtual reality, you get real 3D vision, so you actually have depth perception and a sense of distance and speed. You don't get that on a flat TV screen or computer monitor, so it's really game changing. I also watch YouTube videos of people's laps to get a feel for what good racing lines are, and then I took that back to the simulator and then tried it out. Doing this for a couple hours a night for a whole month leading up to the trip really helped me become completely familiar with the track and the proper line. The event hired sideline photography to come out with their crew of photographers and their expensive cameras and all that and huge telephoto lenses. So I decided to just leave my DSLR at home. We also had a photographer buddy um, tag along and he took pictures of everything. Most of the pictures you'll see in this video series um, were actually taken by him. I did take my DJI Osmo Pocket with me for recording since it's so tiny. For recording inside the car, I took my GoPro Session for the helmet and then a GoPro 4 Silver and Garmin Verb Ultra 30 to attach to the roof of the car and near the firewall glass for a cockpit view. The interior shots unfortunately didn't turn out very well because um, with the tint and stuff it was dark inside the car but it was bright and sunny outside so it blew out the outside shot and you couldn't even see out the window. But luckily I was able to salvage dash cam footage from my dash cam and synced it up with the interior shot so you'll see that later. I took some basic tools uh, along with my motive brake bleeding kit and also took a backup set of Hawk plus pads that I never used for my old R8. Um, and I found out the front pads are identical between the first and second gen R8s. The rear pads are different. That's all I can think of as far as preparations. It took quite a bit of prep to get ready for such a big trip, but it was well worth it in the end. That's it for this one. Next video will be about the actual trip down there. See ya.